What's up, Clean Freaks? It's Hank Balch here with Beyond Clean. We've got an exciting interview in store for you today. We're talking to Dr. Ken Ketchpole about some research that he and his team have done through the years in sterile processing on uh, the topic and the theme of human factors, we're going to talk about what that is, if you've never heard that phrase before, or maybe if you've heard the phrase before, but uh, perhaps you've got a misunderstanding about exactly the implications around this or how we research this and and the various findings that they have surfaced in their study. So um, let me shut up for a second and welcome our guest, Dr. Ken. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So for folks that are new to your name or, you know, who you are, your place in the industry, what exactly do you do? What's your background? And how did you find yourself uh, studying, of all things, uh, sterile processing? <laughs> so as you can tell, I'm originally from England, but I, I've been studying um, patient safety um, and from a, um, from a systems engineering perspective for the last 20 years, um, mostly focused around surgery. Um, you know, initially in the UK, looking at congenital heart surgery, um, and then, uh, and then you know, latterly in the US. Um, and yeah, and, and what I do is try and think about how to design systems for humans to use. You know, the theory being that, well, the, the observation being, it's more than the theory, the observation being that if we design systems you know, that trip people up, then they're going to make mistakes. Or conversely, if we design systems to help people, you know, do the jobs that they want to do and leverage their expertise in the ways that they've been trained to do, then they're going to be successful and efficient. And indeed, they're, they're going to be happy in the work that they do. Mm -hmm. So that, those are the basic principles, um, yeah, which I've been studying and applying in all manner of aspects of uh, of surgery and other parts of acute care for the last 20 years with a view that this will, you know, with a view to reducing the accidental harm um, and, uh, you know, that that we notoriously experience in hospitals. Yeah, that last phrase, <laughs> the harm that we notoriously experience is on the top of everyone's mind inside sterile processing because yes. this is our world. We see the errors. We know the risk. We are confronted with the systems that you kind of called out there, you know, through the system engineering approach. So where does the concept of human factors come into play then? Because you said a large focus is looking at the systems as their design themselves. So what what is human factors and how does it kind of fit into that? Yeah. Um, yeah, let me first tell you how I came to kind of be oh, looking at sure. human factors because I think that that helps tell the story that um, you know that I'm I'm involved in you know analyzing you know, incidents um, at you know at our organization um, and um, you know and you know several years ago now um, we'd had um, some instances that we were exploring of. Um, you know, the wrong instruments or, um, or, or um, uh, bio burden instrument, uh, instruments turning up in the operating room. And so, you know, in discussions, um, the surgeons, you know, the surgeons were of the view that, oh, well, it's just, you know, those people down in sterile processing, they don't really care like I do as a surgeon, you know, and they're on minimum wage and all this sort of kind of stuff. And I said, you know, what I do is look at people in organizations and people in organizations want to come to work to do a good job. Um, and that's, and, and, and I don't think that people in sterile processing are any different. Let me go and have a look. So I went and hung out down in sterile processing to see the work and realized how incredibly complex it is, how challenging it is, um, how much training expertise is required to, required to do it well and how the people down there really care about doing it well and so if we're not doing it well then it's a, not a problem of intent or necessarily skill so what are the problems that people have in doing the work and so of course then we start peeling away at what how sterile processing systems work and the you know and and the requirements that we have within those systems for the people 
Um, you know, and that, so that, you know, that involves looking at the process, you know, from this, the kind of cycle from, uh, you know, from uh, instruments arriving in the operating room to, you know, to um, point of use uh, cleaning down to how, in, how they get down to, the, or how they right. get to the sterile processing uh, through decontamination and assembly and sterilization and storage and ordering and back to the, um, uh, and so all of these things end up being complex and having, you know, lots and lots of opportunities to think about how we can improve different parts of the process. Yeah. And then I realized that nobody had looked at this and that even within patient safety, where there's been an immense amount of interest in surgery and surgical errors and wrong site surgery and teamwork, huge, huge um, uh, levels of research in those sorts of areas, even though sterile processing is fundamental to successful and safe and efficient surgical processes right. nobody ever applied this lens to say how are we supporting the people in doing the work and that's right. that's how it came about you get really shocking to your point you know surgery is not a new thing um all the research around patient safety and around errors in healthcare not a new thing and and yet i don't i don't really know i can't really put my finger on why that gap in research and focus and um, and priority in this sterile processing question has been there, but it's it does tend to kind of the story that you shared an assumption or a presumption around simplicity yes. in the process. <laughs> um, and it's not from those on the inside. It's always everyone else around looking at it and just saying, uh, you know, how hard can it be? Yeah. And why can't you get it right? Yeah, in, in my discipline, human factors, we, the, 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 this is a kind of fairly common problem. We talk about the difference between work as imagined and work as done. So work as, you know, if you've never spent time in an operating room, you probably think that what goes on in an operating room is like this. And actually, if you hang out in an operating room, you'll realize that, no, that's not actually how operating rooms work. The same if you... I don't know, go and sit on an oil rig and see what they do in an oil rig. You have a think idea about what the work in oil, oil rig involves. No, actually, it's not those sorts of things. And so this is exactly the same. And, you know, one of the interesting, you know, and, and of course, you know, sterile processing is, you know, it, it, it's not the, the kind of, I don't know how to call it, the kind of sexy end of clinical hair, care delivery. It's not as exciting as surgery. Um, and so people often just, you know, not only don't, you know, not only don't understand the work that's being involved, they don't think about it until it, it kind of, you know, un until there are problems. Um, yeah, that reminds me of a, a story and experience I've shared a couple of times on the podcast early on in my sterile processing career. I had the opportunity to view some early um, robotic surgeries and I was in a robotic uh, prostatectomy. And it was clear that the surgeon who was operating the robot, very new uh, to the robot and the approach and everything, and there was another surgeon in there with him that was kind of providing guidance. And, uh, and there was all kinds of bleeding and kind of missed clips and everything. And, um, and they got it all wrapped up. And one of the surgeons uh, in turn to the nurse and said, you know, call his wife and let her know that everything went well. <laughs> and I was in the thing like, uh, were you watching a different surgery than the one I was <laughs> yeah, watching? Uh, because everything did not win well. It might have ended well, but it did not go well. And that was the first time that I woke up of, yeah, you know, what we experience on the outside of surgery, maybe what we're told by clinicians in that perception, that assumption is actually not quite true. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, it's funny you should say that. Yeah, that was my very early experience of, wow, there's all this stuff going on that we don't talk about. Right. Um, uh, and that gives us, it's not bad people. It, it's the, you know, it, it, it's the, you know, the, the uh, and if we don't kind of talk about and understand them and, and in fact, you know, research the causes of these things, then we don't improve. Conversely, 
if if we do, then it gives us a huge range of opportunities to improve things. You know, one of my other um, areas of research has been around robotic surgery, interestingly enough. Okay. <laughs> so I understand that. Um, yeah. So as you would uh, uh, describe human factors in that kind of discipline or that category uh, to maybe a clinician, you know, like a sterile processing clinician, for instance, what would you – what are their key categories or the phrases to kind of to get across exactly what that is and what it's not? Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, that, that if you like, um, human factors uh, has, uh, hasn't, you know, it, it, it's common in other industries. It, it arose from aviation Really, in the 1940s, when aircraft were getting increasingly complex, um, and and skilled pilots were crashing these new aircraft, and and uh, and you know, and, and the idea was, oh, maybe we maybe the aircraft you know are too complex for people to use. But then, through re research from psychologists, actually, they found that it was really about the design. So the famous one is the B-17 bomber, where where um, it was easy to confuse when you're coming into land, the pilots easily confused um, the landing gear switch with the flaps switch. Um, and not because, um, you know, not because they can see them, but actually because when you're, when you're flying an aircraft, you want to be looking out of the, of the, uh, of the glass, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> the airport you're landing, not down at the control panel. So, um, so pilots would reach for one switch and get the other one. Now you'll know as a you know if you know anything about flying, if you drop the gear instead of the flaps, that's going to be catastrophic. And so as a result, the the design was not to train people or tell them to work harder, but actually to design um, uh, the feel of the the different you know different switches um, so that one felt like landing gear. If you go on an aircraft, it's it's a circle. It feels like a, you know the, mm. the the lever to drop landing gear is a is kind of circular, and the flaps is more like a kind of sorry flat. It's like a, it's like a flap. So the idea is that oh, immediately you know. So by studying you know these um, uh, you know studying what at first appeared to be human errors, um, we actually find that it's a design problem that we can design out, and so those accidents you know rarely happen anymore so it kind of extended from there the idea that well actually if we you know if we go beyond just the abilities of the human or understand how the abilities of the human kind of ma the, the, sh should match with the environment that they're in and the work that we're asking them to do um then then we're going to be much more successful and so um, there's a big piece of design, simply design within um, the, how the, the design of instruments can have a big impact on, our, on knowing how to use them, on how to clean them, um, uh, and, and indeed, but extending beyond that, the design of a workspace, the design of a you know uh, of an assembly workstation, or the design of um, uh, of a uh, of a sterilizer or the design indeed of a kind of whole process right. that makes it clear how this works and so uh, you know how the system works and so you know reduces uh, the you know it, it increases the ability of uh, of the uh, of the people within the system to know what's going on and reduces the opportunity to make mistakes and so um, if you like um, uh, it, it you know an, another word used is ergonomics and most people come to ergonomics through the design of kind of chairs to fit the body what right. we do is kind of design those sorts of things on a bigger scale <laughs> not a chair but a you know but a technology or or a wider system to hit to to match the you know what we know about the psychology and behavior and abilities of humans yeah i'm it's very I'm broad. Sorry. It's very, very broad ranging. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's terrific. Early on, when I became a manager, um, I somehow stumbled upon a book, and I forget the author now, but the title of the book was something like 
like the design of everyday things. I was, yeah. I, I, I knew you were going to say that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Classic is a guy called, a guy called Don Norman. There you go. Yes. He specifically talks about exactly this. It's very, very kind of seminal, yeah. influential text. And the implication here is that rather than just about training people or, or blaming them when things go wrong, that actually if we look into the design of our systems, it actually gives us a way to, you know, kind of re remove errors almost entirely. Yeah. Um, in yeah. certain contexts, at least. Yeah, the background, uh, I think, you know, one of the things that I remember from that book, he spent a lot of time just talking about doors and yes. how you should be able to look at a door and know, do I push this? Do I pull it? Like, How many of us have run into doors before or, you know, try to do something that is not correct on the door? Not because we're idiots <laughs> um, or because we don't know how doors work. Or we've never used the door before yes. in our lives. Yes, exactly. It's the design failure of Absolutely. a door. That hey, there's going to be humans that are using this door, and what signals humans? And so, yeah, you know, taking that approach and scaling it across an entire uh, complex system like sterile processing, and remembering that there's going to be people in this process that have to do the right thing, and then how can we design it to make it as easy and intuitive for them to do those right things on a regular basis? Absolutely. I think that's that's terrific. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you know the 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 kind of um, the message here is that if something goes wrong and you blame a person and you say uh, you know if you fire them you get put somebody else in their place they are going to make exactly the same mistake. Hmm. There, there's a wonderful there was a wonderful video going around of simply the design of stairs where there was one stair it was, I think it was a stadium or something there was one. One part of the stairs, I saw that. <laughs> which, yeah, which was just slightly taller than the other ones, and successive people tripping on this. Right. right. Um, so it's not the person; uh, it's the it's the design of the world around them that's creating that problem. Uh, and 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 healthcare is full of this, and in fact has you know uh, has this view that mostly we can train this out and it's a really bad idea mm -hmm. you know there, there is tons more stuff we can do aside from what's known as blame and retrain mm -hmm. to improve performance which is one of the backdrops for why the research that you've done here is so critical because as you started there's not been a lot of attention yeah. in this neural processing process and there is a very strong culture of the blame and retrain Absolutely. in whatever scenarios those look like. And so we're just sitting here as technicians. We, we're not necessarily skilled researchers, even though like we can tell, hey, there's something not right about this. Yeah. Uh, but we're just sitting here kind of waving a flag saying, someone, please come back us up that this is not as simple as it seems. It's not all our fault. And yet we can't quite put our finger on what are those root causes. So can you talk a little bit uh, specifically about this study that kind of got us connected, you know, through the interwebs and such a few years ago? Um, what was the scope of the study? What did you expect to find when you started and kind of how did you put that team together? Yeah. So as I said, it came about from a kind of discussion and some early works you know, saying just going to look at the process and then realizing how how little research had been done on this. And then um, what I did is then um, got a grant from the Agency for um, Healthcare uh, Research and Quality, ARC, which is really a small scoping study where I basically said, hey, this is an important part of, uh, of, of surgical safety can we go and explore this from a systems engineering perspective? Would you give some, give me a small amount of funding to do that? And they, and they, you know, they supported that generously, which enabled me then to basically employ a, um, uh, you know, a scientist to go and spend a lot of time uh, in, you know, within, um, uh, within our sterile processing unit here, um, looking at the different processes and the things that go into the success of the processes. One of the wonderful things I get to do, my work is all about other people's work. Um, and when you're so kind of, when you're so involved in a piece of work, you often don't actually know 
what your expertise is. As you say, you kind of when things go wrong, you, you can't put your finger on exactly what it is that went wrong. And I get, you know, what we get to do is do that, you know, mm -hmm. hang around actually with expert with experts and the people working down in process the sterile processing are experts. Um, and you know, and kind of and observe them and talk to them. Uh, and, and and you know we have kind of certain ways of uh, of getting that information out, which kind of reveals both the expertise that goes well beyond actually what their you know what the training is, but um, but also the challenges they have and how the systems work or don't work. So you know so rather than it, this kind of being just oh well it's about cleaning a single tray or cleaning a single instrument we were able to look at, you know, all these kind of different layers uh, and see how they interacted. Um, also start looking across, you know, um, the, you know, we need to think about not just about sterile processing as, as how it works within the, you know, sterile processing department, right. but actually this cycle, um, you know, including... You know, it, because as we know, it you know it starts with the you know point of use um, mm -hmm. and and how um, uh, and of course crosses the organisational boundaries. So if you have instruments that are well cleaned and well organised and um, turning you know you know after surgery, then it makes the whole process much much easier. It reduces the chances for bio burden. It reduces the you know chances of missed instruments. Um, uh, uh, but but if you don't have the have the opposite, if you have a big pile of you know bloody instruments, you know you have sharps risks as well as you know um, not uh, you know a much more difficult challenge. And so uh, and, and so kind of relating the one to the other, relating you know missed instruments or you know dirty instruments, not as one part of you know, but seeing it as a process. Right. Um, that many many people are involved in, you know, was a was a you know uh, was one of the key findings. Um, you know, this isn't uh, the, one of the reviewers said. Oh, surely this is just a management problem. Hmm. No, it goes well beyond just a management problem. It's like I mean, there are obviously management components to it. How do you right. how do you convince the people in the OR who are under time pressure to you know to turn over their surgery to get to the next one that actually this is worth worthwhile doing and you know and how do you provide feedback to them from sterile processing about how well they're doing it you know all those kind of things um and then you know on into um you know the the work of decontamination you know assembly in you know in the complexity of knowing what's in a tray and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and, and and knowing the instruments and the different names for instruments, right. you know the, in, in the huge numbers of names there are for instruments. Um, just the number of instruments that 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 sterile process processors have to somehow know how to process. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the training that that you know that that one manufacturer might give for the cleaning of their one instrument in you know in the thousand, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of instruments that they might have to clean, you know, all the, this kind of looking at these mismatches between, you know, anyway, so, so it kind of revealed all this really, really fascinating stuff about expertise, about the process, um, mm -hmm. about, um, about the work, you know, the complexity of the work, about the kind of interrelationship between these systems. And then, you know, and then, some things we might try to start um, start using this thinking to improve different parts of the process. So that's that's so um, my second grant, which we're on, we're into the third year now. Again, okay. supplied by Arc, is really to kind of expand on that idea. It's a multi-center trial. We're looking at the influence of off-site sterile processing versus on-site. You know, so. In, right. um, uh, we're also, yeah, it's at, um, it, you know, it's that's with um, a higher state um, and the hospitals there, and with some colleagues at Clemson who are modeling the flow of instruments using operations research to see if we can predict certain things. Uh, because, by the way, if we can predict things, then we can maybe help the people at the top of the organization to understand the impacts 
of the decisions they make at the bottom of the organization. So there isn't this recognition that, oh, well, part of the reasons why we have delayed instruments or, you know, or you know, instrument problems is because a decision was made to, I don't know, say, employ three new orthopedic surgeons, but right. there wasn't a budget to, uh, to buy, you know, three times as much orthopedic equipment. So we're Just, having to turn yeah. over. There's never the budget. <laughs> no, that's what, so we're having to turn over and that creates pressures on the system, which means that something has, is going to give. Mm -hmm. But the relationship between those decisions and you know, those, those kind of organizational decisions, right. somebody did a bad thing by missing out instruments, isn't that connection isn't made. And so we're trying to make those connections. So as an organization, we're able to make better decisions. Yeah, what's really interesting about the high level research focus in general of sterile processing is without research, we don't have data. Yep. And and so without it, we're just all making unconnected decisions based on what we think Absolutely. and what we experience in our own little microcosm or, or the own part of the process, our own department, our own facility. And then we've got all these people trying to scale these things that they actually don't have any true data um, to say this is the right approach to improve the process or this is the problem and this is the challenge maybe it's something else that they didn't surface you know through the proper amount of research and so it's it's absolutely critical that we do have more folks more people paying attention with the insight and the perspective that your team is bringing you know to this challenge so my question for you is how do we inspire or engage other researchers because the, the world is very uh, wide open for anything that you can spend your time and your research dollars on and your grant dollars on and everything else. Why sterile processing? What would be the argument that you would give to people out there that are like, ah, oh, maybe? What would you say to push them over the edge? Okay. Um, so, so I mean, without sterile processing, no surgeries will happen. Right? It doesn't doesn't matter who um, who is doing the surgery, how skilled they are. If, you, if they haven't got the instruments, it's not going to happen. Um, and surgery is one of the prime financial drivers for a hospital. So by, by its nature, sterile processing is one of the most important activities any acute care center does. Because with, without it, nothing's going to, you know, nothing's going to happen. And so... Um, this is, uh, and there's an expertise that's involved, that's required to do this well. And it's, there's a phenomenal expertise in all sorts of different, it's not just about cleaning instruments, it's about how, knowing how system works, it's the expertise in being able to analyze the data. It's, it's the expertise and communication involved when, um, you know, around the trays that are gonna be needed or around, you know, access to, you know, quick access to, to, to trays that we you know might not have ordered or expected how we how we how we recover from um, um, you know uh, f uh, from from uh, you know from problems within the system um, quickly so that they don't affect the patient um, right. uh, and and there's so much I mean vast amounts of uh, of research money spent on on uh, on developing new treatments but that might not see the light of day for 30 years if ever fast amounts right. that it's incredible to me that that right now um every day um the work going on in sterile processing to supply you know to enable any sort of surgery to happen is not looked at yeah. um surely surely this is the wrong way to be looking at things we need to be able to part of you know part of developing and improving healthcare and reducing harm is to do, get better at delivering the care we know works now hmm. i know it's great and we do need to be developing new aspects of care and you know new new care treatments and new drugs but given the vast amounts of money that's put into that surely a little bit more could go into 
funding this what you know what is central to any surgical process anywhere in the world right Oh, well, Dr. Ketchpole, um, I know <laughs> we just scratched the surface of this, but what you called out in that call that uh, this is critical to every surgery that happens. There, is, there is no surgery without sterile surgical instrumentation, uh, and that does not happen by magic, and it does not happen in a simple process. Every single department, there is a complex workflow to get these things from dirty to clean to sterile and functional, uh, which we didn't even have a chance to really cover, you know, but there's all kinds of implications around that. So I'm excited and we're super fans over here for the work that you're doing and even that you shared that there's another phase coming out here soon around that offsite piece. So uh, something tells me, even though this is the first conversation we've had, hopefully we're going to have some more here so. in the days to come. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and and I'm super enthusiastic about this and would love to, to hear and, you know, work with, you know, with, with anyone trying to, you know, trying to address these challenges. It's, 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 you know, it, it's really, really important work. Um, and, and, you know, and, and my job is to support really good people, you know, the, the good people who are trying to do this work, um, you know, often, often thanklessly, actually. Yeah. So if uh, anyone wants to track you down to ask you more questions or maybe just to kind of keep tabs on, on your research as it comes out, what's the best way for them to contact you and to follow you? Um, so I, we connected on LinkedIn. I'm there on LinkedIn. Uh, you can probably you can email me. You know, um, uh, uh, or I'm on Twitter. Um, so I'm at Ken Catchpole. Twitter. My email is uh, Catchpole with the out the e at musc.edu. Um, or you can probably Google uh, Google me or find one of my papers and read that. And I think probably my contact. Anyway, there are multiple ways. Um, so yeah, I, I will do my best to uh, to you know respond. And I'm enthusiastic, super enthusiastic about this sort of work. Um, so I'd love to hear from from people. All right. Well, um, I, I want to thank all the audience for tuning in for this conversation. Hopefully, you were encouraged that there are folks that are starting to pay attention to our challenges and to help us make the arguments up all the way to the C-suite, but also across the industry as we have services and solutions that are being created to help uh, to solve our problems. Hopefully, they're going to be created to solve the real problems and not the problems with just the system and, and the people um, in there. So. I want to thank you again, doctor. I want to encourage everyone out there in the sterile processing universe, as we say all the time at Beyond Clean, to keep fighting dirty. 